So what's going on there? Well, the trouble is that computers don't understand these emotions that the people are feeling, the way that they're responding to the software. And psychologists who treat people like that would call them mind blind. They don't understand these hidden signals through the facial expression, the tone of voice, the body posture and gesture that are actually signaling what somebody is thinking. But it's an important part of human-human communication, and so I want to argue that it's an important part of human-computer communication as well. Well, if we're going to think about this, we need to go back and look at the history of the subject, and we need to think about um, the history of studying emotions as expressed in the face. And some of the earliest scientific work on this was done in the 19th century, uh, Charles Darwin, working in Cambridge, uh, working with um, Duchenne de Boulogne in Paris, uh, tried to study people's facial expressions and to see if there was a common language through facial expressions of emotions. And in fact, these uh, pictures that I'm showing here are pictures from uh, Darwin's book on the emotions, uh, which he published um, late in the 19th century, in 1872. Um, and it was interesting, a scientific textbook that sold out in the bookshops in two weeks. Um, his book was very popular. And he was trying to argue that there was a common uh, language in faces. And to illustrate this, he used photographs. It's one of the earliest uses of photographs in scientific publication. And uh, some of these photographs came from uh, uh, Duchenne in Paris. Uh, Duchenne had photographed um, uh, this man you see on the, the right-hand side here, who is uh, actually a tramp off the streets of Paris, and Duchenne had photographed his face in different expressions, and then showed the photographs to people to see if uh, they recognized what the man was feeling. So Darwin repeated this experiment, and he did what we would now call crowdsourcing. Uh, Darwin uh, had a collection of these photographs from Duchenne, and he would invite uh, crowds of people. Well, actually, what he did was invite them to his country house, and he would pass the photographs round uh, over drinks before dinner and ask people what they thought was being shown in the photographs. And here you see some of the photographs from Duchenne's collection. And Darwin entered the results in a spreadsheet, and in fact, these are the spreadsheets here. They're just big sheets of paper, which we have in the library in Cambridge. And down the side, he's got the names of the guests at his party. Across the top, the numbers of the photographs, and he's written in what emotion they saw. And it turns out it was fairly consistent. People recognized the expressions as being uh, happy or surprised or sad. So we did an experiment a couple of years ago. We repeated this using modern crowdsourcing. We used the same photographs, but we made a website where you could look at these photographs, and we invited people just to type in uh, what they thought the, um, the, 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 the photographs were showing. And we got about 20,000 people to crowdsource. Darwin got about 20 people in his crowdsourcing. We got about 20,000 uh, in a couple of weeks. It's really very easy to do science on the web nowadays. And the interesting thing was the reactions of people to the photographs were really much the same as they had been um, 140 years earlier. So these expressions really are quite widely understood, quite universal. And of course, it's an important feature. The, the face is an important way of communicating. Uh, the photographs here show an actress uh, from uh, 1909, a Hollywood star in 1909, who was called Florence Lawrence. She was the biograph girl, and she was making three feature films a week. Three feature films every week. Productivity in Hollywood was rather better a hundred years ago than it is now. Of course, the reason that she made three films a week was that they were very short. They only lasted about 20 minutes each, because that was as long as a roll of film. And she didn't have to learn her lines because they were silent films. But the fact that they were silent films 
meant that she had to express things through her face. And these pictures show the different emotions that she can express through her face. And it was part of her advertisement to, to get extra work. And in fact, there are two different sorts of things that you express through the face. There are the sort of emotions that Darwin studied, which we would now call basic emotions, fear, anger, surprise, things that are important from an evolutionary point of view. And there are also complex mental states, things that are to do with what you're thinking. So confusion or understanding or agreement or disagreement are uh, examples of complex mental states. Well, the, these have been studied a lot more since, and some interesting work was done in uh, the 1980s when uh, Jim Russell in Canada analyzed these emotions, and what you actually see here are a collection of emotion words that he analyzed using a sort of principal component analysis to see how people uh, associated them or thought they were different. And you can't actually read the, the words, but they're things like afraid and angry in one corner of the screen, um, delighted, uh, relaxed, and gloomy. And what he's doing here is identifying continuous axes that you can use to measure emotion. So the horizontal axis uh, is something that we call uh, activation, from very passive to very active. So Things like delighted um, is, is fairly, um, sorry, the, the horizontal axis is actually um, um, the, uh, what's called the valence, going from negative on the left to positive on the right. So positive emotions are things like delight and relaxed, and negative ones are like uh, distressed or depressed. And the vertical axis is activation from passive, so depressed and relaxed, to both low energy sorts of emotions, and the ones at the top, delighted and angry, are high energy emotions. And so this gives us a, a two-dimensional scale on which you can classify emotions. And in fact, there are other axes as well that turn up in the principal component analysis, things like potency, is it weak or strong, is it a tendency, is it inward or outward as an emotion? And these have been used a lot in, in uh, analyses. But it turns out that this picture with them scattered around the circle in a two-dimensional coordinate grid is very misleading. It, it makes you think that you can pick a number for an emotion, or coordinates for an emotion. And it doesn't really work that way. Uh, we've looked at a lot of other emotions uh, and done more recent analyses. And actually what we find is they don't sit around a circle. They actually tend to sit on lines running out from the origin. Uh, and uh, in fact, these record this analysis was done with acted emotions. And so they're all uh, active. There aren't any in the, the bottom half of the space because they're, they're all essentially active emotions. And indeed, we also find that we get quite a wide distribution of emotions. This just shows the scatter plots for the coordinates of a number of different uh, emotions. In fact, um, uh, over here we've got angry, which is, as you can see, on the negative valence and positive activation. But then so is ashamed, although it's not quite as um, extreme in its negativity and it's a bit lower in the activation. Over here, there's proud and interested, which are positive, but they overlap a lot. So we have to be very careful. We can see that these emotions are going to overlap when we try and study them. So what other approach could we use to studying emotions? Well, another way of doing it would be to just try and analyze what words do we use to describe emotions. If we can distinguish two emotions, we probably have different words for them. And so my colleague uh, Simon Baron Cohen in Cambridge has worked on uh, taking all the words for emotions in the Microsoft Thesaurus, there are about 1,200 of them, and then sat down and worked out which ones were essentially different and which ones were uh, synonyms, meant, meant the same thing. And there's about 400 different concepts. They're very finely divided. And you can group those into perhaps 24 higher level groups, which are really quite, uh, quite separate things. So these groups include the 
basic emotions that have been studied by Darwin and then by um, Paul Ekman in the 1970s, things like fear, anger, disgust. These are the emotions that you use for uh, um, uh, evolutionary purposes. You need to understand what another person is thinking or you might be in danger. And they're actually quite easily recognized. You can recognize them from still pictures. And then the other uh, 18 groups of mental states cover these complex mental states to do with what you're thinking. Things like boredom or uh, confusion or um, uh, interest. And these are more difficult uh, to interpret but probably more important from a computer point of view. We need to be able to know whether someone is interested or bored uh, in our, uh, say, computer teaching system that we're using. Well, Simon Van Cohen is a clinical psychologist. He works with children with autism spectrum conditions. And he did some work on putting together a DVD with lots of examples of um, video clips of emotions on. So for all of these 400 finely graduated mental states, he produced uh, videos. Uh, they'd been carefully classified by professional psychologists. And there were six examples of each. So this is a DVD with two and a half thousand videos on of all of these different emotions. All acted, but quite useful uh, for, well, as built, he built games around it for children. And we used it to train some machine learning systems. But in fact, the first thing we did was to look at the time properties of these mental states. Uh, we took these quite short video clips, they're typically five to ten seconds long, and cut them down into quite short sections. So we would show people just uh, one second of video, and then uh, two seconds, and then four seconds, and then the whole video. And by showing them different lengths, we'd then ask them to try and recognize what the emotion was and see how the uh, recognition rate changed with the duration that we showed them. And the interesting thing was that if we showed them the basic emotions, the emotions that Darwin and Ekman had studied, we get more or less constant recognition rate. Uh, at about just over 70% recognition, so 75%. This was on a, a four-way fixed choice, forced choice. But if we showed them complex mental states, we saw that the recognition rate improved as we went up from half a second to one second to two seconds, but after two seconds, it more or less leveled off. And so what that tells us is that People, when they're recognizing these complex mental states, can't do it from a still picture of a face. They need about two seconds of evidence before they can make a decision. And so we built a system uh, in the computer that needed to use about two seconds of evidence. And the way that this worked is we tried to infer conditions, each condition consisting of uh, five or ten of these 400 mental states, and we worked uh, out six different conditions that we thought would be interesting for human-computer interaction. So agreeing, disagreeing, concentrating, interested, thinking, and uncertain. And each of these had a small number of mental states in it, and we then trained it using the videos on the Mind Reading DVD and built a system that monitors your face and gives you information about what you're seeing. And the way that it works is it um, you point a, a webcam at somebody's face, it tracks features on the face, we then do some arithmetic on those features and infer actions. So from the geometry of the coordinates of these features, head up, head down, are, are two different actions. And we can then build on top of that uh, recognition of gestures by the face. So head, a sequence of head up, head down actions is a nodding gesture. And then combinations of gestures tell us about the mental state. So nodding while smiling probably means agreement, but just smiling may just mean uh, interest. And so uh, we use a number of different machine learning techniques uh, to, to do this. And um, 
Here's, here's a video of the system in work. This is a, a girl at a conference uh, where we were demonstrating this. She was being asked to act as if she was agreeing. Uh, you can possibly see there are some spots on her face. Uh, they're, they're, that's not paint, that's just diagnostics from the computer program. And down the left-hand side of the screen, you can see various uh, indicators as to what the gestures are. The top one is nodding, and there's quite a lot of nodding in agreement. And then across the bottom, we see probabilities of different mental states. And the red one is agreeing, which is what we were hoping to see. Um, and what we actually see happening, it takes a little while for the system to make any inference because it takes two seconds of evidence before it starts working. And then we got quite a good trace of agreeing. And then, in fact, she stopped because she wanted to know whether it worked. And we see a little bunch of other um, uh, emotions, interest, confusion, concentration, and then a bit more agreeing. So if I um, show it again, uh, you'll see it's taking a couple of seconds to get anywhere. She's very good at acting the agreeing for a bit, and then stops, asks if she's done the right thing. We say, it like, do a bit more agreeing. So she does a bit more agreeing, and we get a little bit more of the, the red trace, which is agreeing. So this actually looks as if it can work. We can distinguish these uh, reasonably. And what's going on here is uh, we're doing these analyses at four different levels over different time periods. So on the frame level, we're recognizing features in the face at 30 frames a second. Then we're recognizing these actions like head up, head down, um, six times a second. We're recognizing gestures like nodding. Again, updated six times a second, but using about one second of evidence. And then finally, we're calculating the uh, mental states updated six times a second, but using two seconds of evidence. And there are different machine learning techniques being used at different levels. Well, we can um, try this again. Uh, here's uh, one of the videos of the mind reading DVD. So this is one of the bits of acted data, and it fits within one of these categories, agreement, concentration, disagreement, interest, thinking, and unsure. So we should probably try an experiment. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to show you the video again, and then we'll have a quick uh, crowdsourced vote as to what you think the video was displaying. So I'll show it again, and then we'll uh, have a quick vote. So she was trying to act a particular emotion. Now, who thinks that that was agreement? Uh, nobody, right? Uh, who thinks she was concentrating? Uh, yes, one or two. OK, good. Who thinks she was disagreeing? Uh, right, uh, yes, yes, one of those. Um, who thinks she was showing interest? Uh, no, uh, one or two. OK, who thinks she was thinking, uh, quite a lot of people, about a third of you, I'd say, and who thinks she was unsure? She was unsure, not you were unsure. Okay, and that's about half of you. And that's pretty typically the sort of uh, analysis I get when I show this video to people. Well, if we put it through the mind-reading analysis system, what we see is um, that two tracers actually have very high probability. The yellow trace is um, thinking and the brown trace is unsure. So that actually agrees with you. Th those two are clearly both being indicated there and as I said before you can quite reasonably have two different words to describe the same video. These um, emotions do overlap. The purple trace was disagreement and you see there was a, a hint of that in the system at the beginning so that again um, uh, confirms the, the, the view here and there was a little burst of uh, agreement at the end and a little and so on. So there are, there are little nuances, and these things change over time. But there, there are two dominant uh, videos there. In fact, if we had to choose one of them, well, we'd look for the curve with the largest area under it, which is the yellow curve, which is actually thinking. And it turns out that that video was something called uh, brooding, which is within the classification we're using, uh, part of the thinking group. So uh, your analysis is very similar to the systems analysis, and that actually also agrees with what was intended. Well, we, we did a trial on this and, and ran it over all the data um, in the 
in the DVD, and we got this sort of confusion matrix of results. So across the bottom, we have the, the ground truth, what the videos were meant to represent, and receding into the distance, the uh, inferences that the system made. And what you see is there's a very strong diagonal. That's good. That means we're often our inference is agreeing with the label that was on the, the video. And some of them are very good. So for concentration, we're up almost at 90% correctness. Some of them are less good. Uh, for thinking, we're down at about 65%. It actually doesn't recognize it so well. Uh, but it's interesting to see what the confusions are. And instead of thinking, it's saying things like concentrating, interested, and unsure, which of course are, are reasonable um, inferences to make and arguably you shouldn't be trying to separate those uh, mental states anyway. So this looks as if it's quite a useful tool. What we have to always remember is it's never going to give us a precise answer. The answers we get will be a suggestion and we mustn't take it as more than that. It is just a, a hint to our computer system. It's not a, a, we can't just sort of point the camera at someone and know what their innermost thoughts are, but we can get a rough idea uh, most of the time. Well, of course, this was using the test data on the DVD. The question is, how well does it generalize to other people? The DVD was used to train children with Asperger's syndrome, a uh, mild form of autism, and they got to be very good at recognizing any of the two and a half thousand videos on the DVD, but they weren't able to transfer that knowledge to other videos. And uh, that's an interesting problem that's um, uh, a subject of further research. So we were interested, if we took our system and used it with other people, would we get good recognition? <coughs> Well, the answer is um, not as good as we might have liked. So this is now using uh, videos, in fact, like the one I showed you that we recorded at a conference where we were asking people to act and the system's recognition rates are shown in the bottom picture here. Uh, there's still a diagonal, but it's not as good as it was. And we were a bit nervous about this. We thought, oh dear, maybe the system doesn't generalize. But then we realized, actually, that most of the people at the conference weren't very good at acting emotions. And when we got their uh, video clips analyzed by a panel of 18 people, what we saw was that the system was actually agreeing with the consensus view of the panel about 95% of the time. So the system was as good as the consensus view of the panel. Uh, and therefore, it was actually quite good. The problem was really the acting of the people at the conference. Um, and that's another question. How do we distinguish between acted data and naturally evoked data? And I'll come back to that later. Well, the other question, of course, is how fast does this operate? And the answer is, well, it works in real time on a fairly standard um, laptop computer. You just... Uh, um, use a small amount of the processor to, to do the face tracking um, and then very little to detect action units and the gestures, uh, rather more to actually make the inferences about the mental states. Uh, in fact, we've now got a rather better face tracker, but the trouble is the, face, the new face tracker actually uses rather more processor, but luckily computers are getting faster, so this works. So this was an interesting project. It turns out, with some degree of accuracy, we can look at people's faces and understand something about their mental states. So the next question was, well, what about the other ways that we communicate our emotions? Through things like voice, or uh, our gestures, or even um, things like physiology, our, our pulse, our, uh, the heart rate, the, the skin conductivity. So we started doing um, experiments on those. And the first one we looked at was uh, voice. Now, voice is very subtle. Sound is actually harder to analyze than video. Uh, psychologists have, a, uh, have long had a, a language for describing actions in the face. This, this coding of actions in the face is a standard thing used by psychologists. But doing that for voice is much harder. And there are lots of metrics you can compute a voice. If any of you have done voice analysis work, um, you can measure the energy in different frequency bands, the derivatives of those, the second derivatives of those. We're trying to recognize the 
principal pitch, we're trying to recognize the energy in the signal, the tempo, uh, the rhythm of it. So there's hundreds, and we actually measure about 170 different metrics of the voice continuously as it comes in. And the trouble is, some of these are good for recognizing some emotions, and different ones are needed for other emotions. So it's a bit hard to uh, build a system uh, like the previous one. But what we found was, if we were given two different conditions, um, we could distinguish them using really a small number of metrics. Two or three metrics would allow us to distinguish two of the uh, emotions. And we could distinguish two different emotions using two or three other metrics. So what we do is com do these pairwise comparisons. So given a sample of audio, we do, if we uh, are trying to recognize uh, n different emotions, we'll do the half n times n minus 1 comparisons, and then use those as votes to try and work out what the aggregate uh, emotion is. And so we, we analyze these, uh, and at each pair, we're using different sorts of machine learning, um, mostly support vector machines nowadays, and then we have two different ways of combining the votes. You can either try and get a single winner, so try and identify a single mental state, or perhaps more realistically, we can try and look for uh, more than one mental state that's actually been exhibited at a time. So if you have more than one condition that are winning lots of their pairwise comparisons, then maybe you'll count both as being exhibited. And the sort of results we get here for <coughs> the same sort of confusion matrix, if we have a single winner, we get the picture at the top left. This is on nine different conditions. Again, a fairly strong diagram. And if we have multiple winners, we get the picture at the bottom right, um, a much stronger diagonal, but we also are picking up various off-diagonal um, inferences, because of course we can have more than one inference per sample now. But that's actually a, probably a correct thing. One sample may well um, indicate more than one emotion. So that's also fairly successful, and we can use that to uh, recognize um, things in someone's voice. So what about uh, uh, gestures? And um, these rather gray pictures here are very old pictures from, again, from about 1872. Uh, they're of um, an American mime artist who uh, tried to act things only using his facial expression. So there's some fairly extreme facial expressions, but also using his uh, hands to, um, to make gestures. And, uh, the, the actual hand gestures here are quite important. So uh, we became interested, could we analyze these? Could we analyze somebody's gestures? Well, we were doing this a few years ago when it was quite hard to um, monitor uh, someone's gestures. The way you did it was by uh, putting on this rather attractive uh, leotard covered with reflective markers and uh, use a motion capture system. We have a motion capture system like the ones that are used in the movie industry. And uh, as you um, act, you can um, track these different reflective markers and then infer the uh, position of the skeleton. And you can distinguish uh, from that. You could see perhaps that there's a energetic movements for things like anger and droopy posture and slow movements for sadness. Uh, so in fact, we uh, collected some data of our own, but then used a, a database from some colleagues in, in Glasgow who had recorded, using a motion capture system like that, uh, a database of actors, 30 actors, each one acting uh, four different activities. These are both showing knocking in four different ways. And these are uh, angry and sad. So there's um, uh, an angry knock. Um, and um, on the right, a, a sad knock. And you can see there's a slight difference in the dynamics. Well, we then tried to use the same sort of techniques to analyze these. And it turns out that's really difficult because uh, as you analyze somebody, the, the, the information you get from the tracker. We were looking at things like the joint angles, which tell us something about the posture, and the derivatives of the joint angles, which tells us something about the speed, 
and the second derivative, which tells us about the, the jerkiness, what you actually find out is what um, the person is doing. So you, you in, immediately you, you find out whether they're knocking or lifting or throwing or walking. But we don't want to know that. We want to know how they're doing it. So we had to break the video up into uh, short uh, sections, rather like syllables. So if you're knocking, there's a sort of a raising phrase, then a strike and a retract and a strike and a retract and a strike and a retract, and then a putting the arm down phase. And if we can separate out those different phases, then you can look at the motion within each of those by itself and analyze that. So we, we have to break it up into these um, gestural, like syllables really, in speech analysis. But then it turns out, it, when you look at that, the, the information you get is who is doing it? Because it turns out each person has a, a rather different way of moving. And so you need to train this system on individual people. The facial analysis and the voice analysis both work quite well uh, on any person. You train it on one set of data and it generalizes to other people quite well. But these uh, turn out to need to be <coughs> trained on the individual. And so we have to factor in uh, an individual signature. So we first of all segment it and then um, get the individual signature, and that can push the recognition rate up to about 80%. Uh, and the, the key here is um, partly, well, mainly going from um, the, uh, the biased, in other words, personal signature to the, um, oh, sorry, the, 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 the biased version is just where we're, we're taking any old uh, video, and then if we train it on an individual person, we can push the recognition rates up to the bottom row here, and segmenting improves that slightly as well. So um, again, this is a, a quite a successful technique, and we can we can recognise quite a lot of what's going on there. Well, the other thing that we've become interested in is when people talk to each other, they use their hands a lot, and there's this combination of hands and faces. You often put your hand over your face when you're talking to people or when you're thinking, and the different places that you touch your face and the way that you hold your hand, we th thought might indicate something. Now, of course, hands over faces are something of a nuisance for a video recognition system. What we find is that they, uh, uh, they block the view of the camera, so we don't get very good face tracking. But actually, there's a lot of information in where the hand is, so we'd like to try and understand it. So we recorded some videos um, of people interacting with a computer system necessarily a hands-free computer system. So they were using voice analysis to play games on the computer. And some of them were collaborative, two people playing, and some were just single person playing. <coughs> and then we had to work out, uh, and, and, and we found that about a third of the videos, they put their hands over their faces. And so the question then was, well, um, do they all do it the, the same way? Is there a common understanding of this language of hands over faces? And so the way that we tested this was by crowdsourcing. Now, crowdsourcing, as you'd expect, on the internet. And what we did was make a game for Facebook where we had these videos of people um, uh, interacting and checked to see if they had an agreement on what they thought was being gestured. So this actually... Is, is quite a good way of getting video labelled. It turns out for these sort of problems, machine learning depends on having a lot of training data and labelled training data. And that's really hard work if you have to pay people to watch hours and hours of video and label it. But what we could do is make a game on Facebook and then people can just, um, all over the world, with nothing better to do, will label our video for us. And as long as we're a little careful about filtering out people who are being silly and so on, we can actually get quite good labelling. And so we're now analysing that data and we've just, we'll in fact be publishing uh, in a couple of months the, the first results from that, that the, uh, the significance of these hand over face gestures. And then finally, the other sort of measurement that uh, has some popularity is physiological measurement. So um, things like... Uh, uh, your skin conductance. If you put two electrodes on the skin, if a person is excited, uh, they sweat slightly, and the sweat 
uh, reduces the electrical resistance of the skin, and you can measure that. You can measure their heart rate, and particularly the way that their heart rate is varying. You can uh, attach electrodes to their skull and try and work out what's going on in their, their brain, or you can put them in an MRI machine and watch what's going on inside their brain. And of course, these things like skin conductance and heart rate uh, are the classic things that were used in uh, the polygraph, the lie detector that you see in old movies. And incidentally, you only do see it in movies, you never see it in real life because it's completely useless. Um, it turns out that these are very unreliable measures. Most of these physiological measures are uh, terrifically unreliable. Um, you can use them for a short period of time, but you'll find that even with the same person, if you repeat the experiment an hour later, you'll get completely different results. And the, the point of the polygraph as a lie detector is it's just lots of technology and it frightens people into telling the truth. It doesn't actually really tell you much about what's going on. Uh, so these are uh, interesting uh, measures uh, the, that you can have. You, you know, have all this high technology. It's rather invasive stuff to plug on to people. And it turns out it doesn't really tell you anything terribly interesting. However, if we've been looking at these, we've found that there is something that is quite a useful indicator and um, we spent some time looking at people's eye movements and it turns out that you can uh, watch very fast eye movements, the saccadic eye movements that take um, uh, perhaps a, a tenth of a second. So these are very fast movements, uh, faster than reaction times. Well, that's interesting, they're faster than your reaction time but the eye will move to points of interest. And it turns out that you can see uh, if someone is having to think hard, the time changes. Funnily enough, they get quicker at fixating on targets. Um, and this turns out to be uh, something that's in the autonomic system, you can't control it. And it's quite a useful way of telling if somebody is um, preoccupied or concentrating uh, because their eye will actually fixate faster on other targets. And we, again, we're uh, just analyzing uh, some data from a large experiment we've done trials of this and we're now, we've just now done a, a large experiment and they're just analysing the data. But this is, seems to be quite a good way of measuring whether somebody is um, concentrating. Well, I should say a little bit about expressing emotions, computers actually expressing emotions back to people. And this brings us to robots. Um, incidentally, if you ever want to get um, publicity, get a robot. They're really good. The press love them. They're not actually terribly useful, but they're, they're very good for getting publicity. And of course, robots are um, very popular in films. So you see a couple of film robots here. And you'll notice they have very big eyes. The eyes are an important part of the expression. About half the emotion in the face is in the eyes. And it's no accident that the robots have very expressive eyes. Um, and there's some suggestion that robots are going to appear in the homes. So, of course, we've had robots working... Uh, in factories for a long time, so big strong robots building cars. But of course people don't go anywhere near them because the robots aren't aware of people and they'll just uh, kill you if you go near them because their arms will swing round. Or we have robots in the home, so things like um, vacuum cleaners that automatically go around the house picking up the dirt. But they're actually very feeble and they can't do much strong work. But what we're about to have are domestic robots that will be strong enough to do something useful but will be in the home. And so think of a care assistant. You have an old person living at home. They might have a robot that helps them with their tasks. Um, there's a picture here of what somebody thought might be a good robot to use in healthcare. So if you've collapsed on the floor, this robot um, would come up and... Um, diagnose what's wrong. Now, I, I don't know about you, I think if I'd just had a heart attack and I was approached by a Segway with a television set on the top of it, it would not be good for my health. But um, some people thought this might be a good idea because it ought to have a human face. So we thought we'd actually look scientifically at whether an expressive face changes people's perceptions of their conversation with a computer. And so we did an experiment where they actually had a conversation with a robot monkey. Uh, the only reason we got a monkey was it's very cheap to buy robot monkeys and we could then uh, rewire the inside so you could control it from a computer. 
And we programmed this to mimic people's facial expressions. So we pointed a camera at a person who was having a conversation with the monkey, point the camera at the person, measure their facial expressions and gestures, and play them back on the monkey, not, not immediately, but after a, a short delay. And we tried that against just having the uh, monkey make random uh, actions. And it turns out that people actually thought, as they had a conversation with this robot, that it was paying more attention if it mimicked their facial actions. So it turns out that it does matter. A computer system that nods its heads at the right time and is sympathetic actually um, is more fun to talk to than one that has a random expression. So the question then is, how realistic does the robot need to be? And so we did a, an, another uh, crowdsourced survey where we showed video clips of different sorts of robots, uh, ranging from a, a vacuum cleaner, well, up to a human being. We showed video clips of these being um, abused in various ways, so being thrown out of windows or hurt. And people's empathy, their uh, sympathy for the uh, protagonists, increased the more human they looked. So it would seem that there is uh, some good reason to make robots that look like people, and then they will be more engaging for the people who interact with them. So we um, uh, had a very realistic robot built by uh, David Hansen, who is a puppet maker uh, in America, in Texas. Um, and he made us this uh, robot, uh, you can see on the right here, um, which has a very realistic prosthetic face and inside the head there are about 28 motors that act like muscles and we can play quite detailed expressions on the, on the face. Uh, and uh, here you see some of the expressions that the face can make and the robot with its, uh, when it's dressed, so you can actually we put a wig on it. Uh, if you're interested, it looks like um, uh, the young uh, Charles Babbage, the computer pioneer, because um, we thought he had quite an expressive face. <coughs> well, uh, th this is something that it turns out actually this, this is perhaps too realistic, but not, it's, it falls into what people call the uncanny valley. This is quite realistic, but um, you can see that it's mechanical, and so uh, people find it slightly disconcerting to talk to, um, particularly disconcerting because some of the motors don't work, so it sometimes looks as if it's got a, uh, a facial tick. Um, and in fact, one of the uses we did for this was to train doctors who were going to have to deal with patients who had uh, muscular problems in their face. And doctors, when they meet these patients, often uh, are quite surprised when they see the uh, um, patient's faces pulling in funny directions. It's a disease called dystonia. Uh, and what we did was we videoed some patients with dystonia and then replayed those videos on the robot to the doctors before they saw real patients and we measured the difference in the doctor's reaction and it actually was quite useful in training the doctors to control their own expressions when they were talking to real patients. So this actually turned out to be quite a useful training tool and the fact that the robot had slightly odd facial movements actually was quite a useful thing. Well, so we can recognize emotions, we can even display emotions. Uh, what might we try and use this for? Well, there are all sorts of things that are come to mind that uh, ideas that we've uh, uh, thought about, um, instant messaging systems on your mobile phones, classically of course, don't convey emotional information. You put little emoticons in, well we could generate the emoticons automatically. Uh, we've done some work on an emotional hearing aid. This is for children with autism spectrum conditions. You can imagine them wearing a, a camera on their glasses, think of something like Google Glass, point it at the face of the person they're talking to <coughs> and analyze the other person's expression and, and warn the child if there's an emotion being shown that the, they're not recognizing. Uh, we've tried using it for online learning systems. So we monitor somebody who's using an online teaching system and we can then change the speed of the lesson if they're interested or bored, confused or understanding. And, uh, well, all sorts of things like that. Uh, you can imagine a similar sales assistant for if you're doing online purchasing on 
Amazon. It could have a webcam pointed at your face that would um, uh, analyze uh, whether you were interested in the products that were being shown or not and respond accordingly. It has to be said, dealing with the press is very interesting and when we um, first spoke about the emotional hearing aid, the idea that you could have a camera uh, pointed at someone you were talking to and you'll get feedback about what that person was thinking. Uh, this was <coughs> um, back in 2006, so actually before uh, Google Glass had appeared, uh, the press picked up on it and um, uh, uh, their idea was this would be for people speaking at meetings, the bore-ometer, so I'd have a camera pointed at you and I could get warned if you were getting bored with what I was saying to you. Um, it wasn't quite the sort of press headline we wanted, but it is quite fun. Uh, this was uh, in, actually it was very nearly on April the 1st, so I'm not entirely sure that it was meant as a serious article. More seriously, well, one of the areas that we're interested in is car driving. Uh, when you drive a car nowadays, cars are getting more complicated, they have more uh, electronic systems in them that are interrupting you, the roads are busier, and if you're driving through an unfamiliar city centre and you're lost, and you're late for a meeting, the last thing you want is a satellite navigation system that tells you to make a U-turn. It'll probably cause an accident. What you want is a system that monitors you, and if it sees that you're confused and concentrating, it should remove distractions rather than give you extra distractions. So it should stop your mobile phone from ringing, maybe turn the radio off in the car, maybe even let you drive in the wrong direction for a bit until you recover your composure and then bring you back in for another attempt. So we wondered, could we use our facial analysis system to analyse the face of a car driver? So this is uh, my research student, uh, Rana El Kaliubi, who did all the early work on this system, uh, who was living in Cairo at the time, went back to Cairo, put a webcam on the dashboard of her car and filmed herself as she drove round Cairo, um, getting lost and talking on the mobile phone. Talking on a mobile phone is illegal in Cairo as well, incidentally, but um, these, these things we do. And uh, when we analysed the video, well, we saw all sorts of different uh, expressions. Um, not much pleasure. Um, there was actually uh, quite a lot. This is when she got herself lost deliberately and was trying to find her way back. We're seeing quite a lot of the, the blue, which is uncertainty, and a certain amount of green, which is being upset. And this sort of looked as if it might work. So uh, we needed to do some proper experiments. The difficulty with driving analysis is you very hard to do scientific experiments. You can't do repeatable experiments. You send out two people um, uh, at two different times. Of course, they've got completely different traffic, and it's very hard to analyze the data. Uh, what you get is anecdotal reports that just say, it looked as if it worked. And we wanted to be a bit more scientific. We wanted lots of people to drive in exactly the same conditions. So uh, we went and uh, used some time on a, a, a quite complicated uh, driving simulator, which has a real car um, mounted on little motors that make it wobble, and uh, with a big screen surrounding you. And you can then drive, and you can set up uh, routes that people have to follow. And we analyze the driver's reactions. Uh, and this is quite a realistic simulator. Actually, the graphics are really not terribly impressive, um, but it's quite compelling because it's big screen and round you. And uh, I was trying this with the man who, you, who ran the simulator, who owned it. And <clears throat> being a computer scientist, we were driving along a motorway, and I was interested to know what the graphics would do if I drove inside the lorry in front of me. So I just accelerated through the back of the lorry. And um, the man who ran the simulator next to me put his hands up in front of his face because he was frightened as we drove into the picture. And that was quite interesting, I thought. He knew it was a picture, but he actually f believed it was, it was real. Um, well, the thing that we learned from that is actually most of the time when you're driving, you look pretty bored. Um, that actually turns out you don't often have much excitement driving. Um, and this simulator was quite expensive to use, so we thought, well, let's build our own, then we can run longer experiments. Uh, and so we, we bought some um, simulator software from a company in America. It's quite expensive. It cost about $10,000. Built a big screen simulator, got a, a model car 
uh, I'm sorry, a car driving seat that you could sit in, and did some experiments. And we found that um, this commercial simulator um, didn't have very good graphics. It wasn't very convincing. It had a very limited set of roads you could drive on. It was very badly instrumented. You didn't know where the cars had gone. Um, and you couldn't really control the other traffic. So actually, it was very, not very useful for doing complicated experiments. And then one of my students had a rather good idea. He bought a copy of Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto has very good graphics. It has very large route maps that you can actually analyze and run your own route planner over. It has very good instrumentation. You know to within a few centimeters where the car has driven. And um, you can control the other traffic. You can make the other traffic aggressive, or you can change the weather and make it wet or sunny. And so this actually turns out to be quite a good tool for doing experiments, and it only costs $100, not $10,000. So um, the, the trick is always use commodity parts. And so here I am driving in our, our simulator uh, through San Andreas, if those of you know Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. So we did some experiments. Uh, I happen to have a robot sitting next to me for reasons that you needn't uh, worry about, but um, uh, that was just to do with the video we were making. So we did some experiments with that, but what we found was that people didn't take it seriously. They knew it was a game. And so what we were making them do was drive uh, through busy streets with bad weather, and we're making them do mental arithmetic at the same time. This is the way we ramp up the cognitive load. We were trying to see if we could see the confusion on their faces. And, uh, uh, and they crash. Um, but they, they just laughed when they crashed. They weren't actually engaged with it. Um, and so we had to think, well, how can we make this more compelling as an experience? And we hit on another idea. What we did was to get hold of some of these uh, quadrotor remote control drones. These things are sold as toys. You drive them with your mobile phone. You get a picture coming back from it to your mobile phone and you can steer it. Well, we reprogrammed it slightly so that it would sit on the infrastructure Wi-Fi network in our laboratory so it could go further away. And rewrote the control system so that rather than being a mobile phone, it was our controls back in the lab. So these things can then fly off uh, round the uh, corridors of the uh, department and you're driving it from the, in fact, the car driving simulator back in our laboratory with a big screen showing you the picture out of the, um, the front. So here you see uh, my research student, Ian Davis, uh, driving the helicopter, and he's seeing the picture that's being relayed back over Wi-Fi from it as it drives around the lab. This turns out to be really quite a useful tool. Uh, firstly, it's a great way of irritating other people in your building. If you fly helicopters into their offices and out, they're going to get cross with you. But apart from that, um, it means that we've got the subject in the seat, so we can attach um, instrumentation to them, monitor their face or whatever. But they're doing a, a real-world task that's still repeatable. We can make people go around the same course we can make them do mental arithmetic when they're doing it, and they get real emotional engagement because they can hear the helicopter going up the corridor. They know that if it crashes, somebody's got to go and pick it up and set it going again. Uh, and in fact, we can see that even using physiological measurements, which, as I say, are reasonable over short time periods, not so good over long time periods. Um, this is quite a busy slide. On the left, um, you see... Uh, the driving simulator, and in each box, uh, the, the, the two graphs on the left show you uh, at the top uh, skin conductance and at the bottom heart rate, and then within each chart, the two little um, scatter plots are for easy driving and hard driving. And what you see is for driving, um, it really made no difference whether it was easy or hard. There was just a marginal difference between the two because people weren't terribly upset with the hard driving if they got it wrong. But on the right, we have them flying the helicopter. And here, where we went from easy to hard, we saw significant differences in their physiological reactions. If we made it hard, they really got nervous. So this actually is quite an interesting technique. We can do repeatable experiments in the laboratory, but rather than using a simulator, we use remote control. And that actually gives it uh, a realism, so they get this emotional engagement. So that's a, a, a 
sort of working towards uh, an application in, in driver monitoring. Now, we've also done, uh, in fact, the Rana El Kaliubi, the student who did a lot of this earlier work, has set up a, a company that's got a commercial system that measures uh, just the valence, the, um, um, uh, whether you like something or not. Uh, using cameras and is using this as a commercial product it's being used to test things like television commercials so they get an audience in show them a draft a, 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 an early commercial and then monitor the faces of the audience and see whether they enjoy it or not and it's also been used to monitor the audience at political debates and you can actually uh, correlate the facial expressions of the audience with the change in their political views uh, over the course of a debate. And so this is actually turning into quite a, a successful commercial product. Uh, meanwhile, back in the lab, we've been working on um, uh, a large European project that's looking at uh, teaching children with autism spectrum conditions emotional awareness. And you remember this was some of the early work we did right back with the mind reading DVD. Well, we've come full circle. What we've done is get together with a company that's making a, an adventure game for children, but as various things to make progress in the game, they have to recognize or express emotions. And we're using uh, the analysis systems that we've built to monitor particularly the facial expressions, and then some colleagues have done other systems for voice and body posture and gesture. And the idea is that the children learn about how to express emotions by watching videos, and then they have to act it themselves, and we have monitoring of what they're doing. So we can monitor either uh, discrete mental states, this is the latest version of the program, or we can monitor um, uh, continuously in this valence arousal space uh, of uh, what your, your, your face is expressing. And, and give the children feedback as to whether they're acting the emotions well or not. And, and learning to mimic emotions is a very good way of learning about emotions. And we've also made a game that um, <coughs> uh, takes your face and tracks it and then animates a cartoon of somebody else. So you perhaps can't quite tell, but this is um, uh, one of my students, uh, Leo Impit, who, was, uh, who built this system. The system is tracking his face and the picture on the right actually has my face imposed in the middle, and my face is being animated uh, in whatever he's doing. And this turns out to be quite fun for children. Um, they can act and see somebody else's face being animated, or we can take a photograph of the child and then use one of our recorded videos as the control signal and animate the child's face to show them what the expression should look like. And that turns out to be... Um, uh, quite an engaging game for children to play and they rather like this and we um, also use it at, at demonstrations for outreach events. So we're, we're, we're working towards therapeutic uses of this sort of technology and that seems to be uh, quite an interesting application. Well, there are lots of other things that we're, we're working on as well. We're looking at uh, different mental states, working away which, which mental states are appropriate for different conditions, the ones we use when interacting with a computer are very different from the ones that you'll want to understand when you're driving a car. Um, we need to uh, see if there are any differences between these. Uh, we're trying to combine the different sensors. We've done some work on combining voice and face so that we analyze both together and we're still working on that. Um, we're interested in naturally evoked emotion. So a lot of our work so far has used video recordings of actors and we need to move towards naturally expressed emotions because they're just more difficult and also more common. Uh, and we're continuing to look at applications in things like uh, online education and um, uh, remedial tools for children with autism. Well, I've given you a... Uh, uh, a pretty broad picture of some of the problems that we have in making computer systems that are emotionally aware. Uh, we start with problems in psychology, like how do you classify emotions? Do you use discrete words or do you use continuous measures in a two-dimensional, three-dimensional space? You need to collect data 
and label it. That's hard, but we've seen how uh, crowdsourced labeling can actually make this a lot easier. We've seen how you can use machine learning to make inferences. We've seen how we can use robots, and we've also used cartoon avatars for synthesis. <coughs> and we're beginning to look at how we can combine different modes of analysis. And all of this is, is leading us towards applications, and we're just beginning to see the, the first commercial products, things like the um, Affectiva Aftex system and the ASC Inclusion game are now uh, appearing on the market. And this is uh, an important future aspect of human-computer interaction. Well, um, of course, I don't actually do any of this work. It's all done by uh, incredibly clever research students uh, who do all the work, and I should acknowledge uh, all of their efforts, all my colleagues who've uh, built these systems over the years. Uh, and that's probably a good time for me to stop, and I'd be very happy to take any questions, if you like. Thank you very much.